Welcome to the keynote stage. So my name is Mark Walsh. I'm the founder of this conference and part of the leadership team with Daniela and Manel. We have got quite a feast, quite a treat installed for you. The main stage doesn't have all the top names on. Some of them are spread out for various logistical reasons, but there are some awesome presenters on this stage. This stage is also sponsored by Alain Stefani. When we first had the idea of getting sponsors, I basically said, I won't take anyone as a sponsor unless I love what they do, because otherwise it, it doesn't have any integrity for me. I didn't know who Alain Stefani was, but I met her in Berlin. Someone said, oh, she's an intimacy teacher, she's an ex-sex worker, best-selling author in Germany. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll meet her. And I met her, and as soon as I met her, I felt at ease. I felt like, wow, this is a person who's playful, but also a deep listener. This is a, a woman who's a real leader. Uh, since I've seen her work uh, with people in very, you know, around trauma, around intimacy, around very difficult areas, men and women, I've come to regard her as a friend, actually. Like, I love her. So go to her website and check it out. It's Alan, I-L-A-N, Stefani, S-T-E-P-H-A-N for November I, alanstefani.com. There's an offer there called Love and Rage, which is as juicy as it sounds. You'll also find links in the descriptions uh, for the videos below. So welcoming Peter Levine, one of the most established names in trauma education in the world, author and absolute legend, frankly. Peter, welcome. Hi. Hello from, uh, from Maine. So, so um, I understand a little bit about what the conference is um, concerning, but maybe if you give me a couple of little hints here and I'll take it. Sure, no there. problem, Peter. So we've got until the hour and um, the conference is for people interested in embodiment of all kinds. We have many therapists, yoga teachers, meditation teachers, dance teachers, and uh, people are extremely interested in trauma. We have a wide variety of people completely new to trauma and experienced therapists. And basically, I know people are delighted to hear whatever you have to say about trauma. So over to you, sir. Okay. Well, when I first started to developing somatic experiencing, um, I had the disadvantage, no, maybe the advantage of not knowing that trauma was supposed to be a brain disorder, a brain disease that at best uh, could be managed by changing one's thoughts or by using drugs. And uh, so I was free to explore where my meanderings took me. Um, one of the basic things, again, related to the idea of embodiment is that trauma is not just something that happens in the brain, in the mind. I mean, it does, of course, it's something that happens throughout the whole organism, but really it's primarily something that happens in the body. And when we are traumatized, when we are overwhelmed with threat and especially with mortal threat, life threat, our body goes into a stereotype set of reactions. So for example, our shoulders tighten, our jaws tighten. Um, we, um, we're unable to breathe, to, to, to take a deep breath. And all of these things are again, things that the body does. And so what I discovered was that the way of healing trauma was to be able to find new experiences in our bodies, experiences that specifically contradicted those of overwhelming helpless, that is to say, of trauma. And uh, one of the main things that happens in trauma is something that's called dissociation. And this, the basic idea of dissociation is that dissociation is cutting off from our bodily experience. And again, that's what happens when we're overwhelmed. We lose contact from the, from the experience, from the living body experience. And we're cut adrift without a sense of vitality, of aliveness, of capacity to be in the here and now. The other side of this is that trauma, when it's resolved, can lead to transformative experiences which are rooted in the body. 
Um, just want to make sure you're hearing me, okay? Because I, yeah, okay, good. Uh, in 1969, uh, a formative event occurred, which really channeled the direction of my life. Uh, I was developing a series of um, body awareness exercises to help people that had um, high blood pressure. And I discovered by helping them learn how to, to, um, to release certain muscles in their jaw and their neck, that often their blood pressures would go like from 160 to normal or even or sometimes even greater. And often this happened in one or two sessions, but, but sometimes it took more. Well, anyhow, um, a friend of mine, a very dear friend and colleague, Ed Jackson, um, he was a psychiatrist in Berkeley, and he, um, he asked me to see a patient. And he was referred to this patient uh, by a, another, an, another physician, uh, and she had these, all of these physical symptoms, symptoms which we now would call fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, chronic fatigue, severe, uh, severe PMS, migraines, and so forth. And so she was sent from, from specialist to specialist and nothing could be found. So finally, they, was, they referred her to a psychiatrist, my friend Ed, and he tried her at that time, if you can believe it, there was one antidepressant medication and one anti-anxiety medication. And um, the other thing that was associated with all of these physical symptoms was that she would be having panic attacks and was so afraid of having a panic attack that she would stop even leaving her, her house. Uh, this is called agoraphobia. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, so they thought that at least if the medication would help reduce the anxiety, maybe she'd be able to get some of her life back because her life was compressed to almost nothing. By the way, we'll call her Nancy. So anyhow, um, uh, Ed thought that maybe some of these exercises that I was developing would be helpful, could be helpful. So she came in and I could see from her carotid pulse, her pulse was about 120 beats a minute. She came in with her husband because she couldn't leave the house at all. And even with her husband, it was an ordeal. And I could see that both of them were so uh, frightened and, and um, uh, you know, of her with her total need for him and her and him for needing to take care of her so greatly. Anyhow, uh, I explained to them what I would be doing, that I would be teaching her certain relaxation techniques involving body awareness. And uh, so I had her come into the consulting room and she was laying on a, on a mat, mattress, and uh, I started to help her relax some of those muscles in, in her neck and jaw. And much to my happiness, her heart rate started going down. So it went from 120 to 110, 100, 90, 80. And then at about 75, her pulse shot up way, way up to about 160 beats a minute. And not knowing what to do, I did what probably is the stupidest thing that anybody would think to do. And maybe you can guess what that is, what that was. And I said, Nancy, you must relax. You need to relax. At that moment, at that time, her heart rate started going down again, down to 120, to 110, 100, 90, 80, 70, 60, then into the low 50s and she turned pale and I said I didn't have the words I said to myself I don't know what to do and I was even as I tell this you know this was how many this is 1969 I still got a little twinge 
in my chest, just a small twinge. And, um, and of course it moves through, you know, I mean, you, I do basic, my basic embodiment SE practice and it's there and then it moves through. So anyhow, uh, I saw at that trying moment, uh, I saw the image on the far, far wall of the, of the therapy room. I saw a image of a tiger crouch getting ready to spring. And without not quite not knowing uh, why, I mean, I, after a bit, it, it became clear to me, but initially I didn't know why. I said, Nancy, there's a tiger. There's a tiger chasing you. It's crouching, it's chasing you now. Run, run, climb those rocks and escape. And as I said that, I saw her body become even more frozen. And I said, Nancy, it's okay, you can do it. In other words, I basically just encouraged her. Just feel your legs, feel where there's any strength at all in your legs and just let your legs move you. And then when you come to this, the rock wall, cl climb, sit on top and escape. And so her body went through several cycles of gently shaking and trembling. And sometimes her fingers would turn blue cold. It's like she wasn't able to even get a breath. Then a spontaneous breath would occur and the fingers would become warmer. Then the whiteness in her face started to change with waves of good, normal, healthy color. And this went on for about 30, at least 30 minutes. And at the end of 30 or 40 minutes, I could see she was just profoundly relaxed. Her breath was even, her color was even. And she opened her eyes and she looked at me. And she said, do you wanna know what happened? And I said, yes, I would definitely be curious about that. And um, she said, when um, you, you uh, told me to, to, to see the, the tiger, run from the tiger, uh, at that point, I, I, was, I felt like I was dying. I felt like I wasn't gonna survive. And she said to me, she said, and then when you told me, when you said and gave me the encouragement, because I felt like I was dying and I was just saying in my mind, doctor, don't let me die. Help me, help me, don't let me die. But her words were so muted that again, I could barely hear the words. But again, after she started to experience this profound change in her bodily reaction, um, she offered the following. She said, when you told me uh, to see the tiger, I could do that. When I started to run, my legs were like lead. It was like I was trying to run in, in, in mud. But finally, I could feel my legs gaining in strength. And then when I came to the wall, I could feel my hands reaching and pulling myself up rock by rock. And when I got up and looked down, I saw the tiger and then the image of the tiger changed to seeing myself when I was four years old and I was being held down by doctors and nurses while an ether mask was forced onto my face uh, for a, root a routine tonsillectomy. And she described what she was, and I asked her, well, what are you noticing now? And she said, it feels like I'm being held in warm, tingling waves. And this was something that I was to discover in working over the decades with literally thousands and thousands of, of people who are suffering from different kinds of trauma. And um, 
that um, that once in transforming trauma, one comes to a deeper positive sense of our own bodies. In other words, of embodiment. So rather than trying to erase a trauma or change a person's thoughts about a trauma or, um, or just medicate the trauma, by the way, I'm not against medication. Um, for short term, some medication can be helpful. But it was really coming home to the body. And that was the, I think, the biggest discovery, although I didn't really have the words for it at that time, because I don't think even the term embodiment was even used. I don't even remember when exactly it was, you know, started to become more, more well known. But anyhow, the fact that she transformed this experience into what maybe one could even call a spiritual experience or even better, an embodied spiritual experience really then channeled the rest of my life in continuing to work with trauma and basically to develop an approach that I could teach to, stu to, to students and who to therapists and that they could um, use with their clients. And so around that time, I started to um, give a, uh, a seminar for a group of Berkeley therapists. I was living outside in my, what I call my tree house, my Wildcat Canyon tree house. And uh, in working, to, I tried to explain to them what I was doing, why I was doing it. And I would do that by demonstrating with them one at a time and then trying to get the right words, the right metaphors to explain what was going on. And, um, and that group of 12, I think it's 12 or 15 people, that's still in my mind the way the, the approach somatic experiencing is taught. And when I was told that it that was now being taught to 40 or 50,000 people worldwide, I just couldn't do that. I couldn't understand how is that, how is that possible? And again, I think the reason it, that it was so central to embodiment, and I think that's what we are missing, not just because of trauma, but because of over-socialization and because of neglect and fear of having bodily experiences. So, um, so that was the basic idea. Now, there were two things that I also noticed with uh, Nancy. Again, her heart rate was very high when we started. And as it came down, and then it shot up, that's the sympathetic nervous system. It's the branch of the nervous system that's involved in fight or flight. Fl flight. And when Nancy had held, was held down by the nurses and doctors, and put and the mask forth on her face. What she what she had experienced is that her body was frozen, that it couldn't do anything to escape, but her body wanted to escape. It needed to escape, and it needed to escape for twenty years until we had the session together when she was twenty four years old. So I started to discover how many different things happened to us where we're threatened, where we're overwhelmed, but they don't over they don't unhappen. <laughs> and also when her heart rate went very down, very, very low, and when she pleaded with me, locked her eyes into my eyes, doctor, I'm dying, I'm dying, don't let me die, help me, help me. That's what later Stephen Porges described as the uh, shutdown system, the uh, dorsal vagal shutdown system. So there are three main systems that govern how we are in the world and how we experience ourselves in the world. One is the sympathetic fight or flight response. The other is the shutdown response, which involves a hyperactivation of the gut, of the viscera, also involves a very profound slowing of the heartbeat, and also to, um, to experience uh, one's life was hanging in the balance. 
And so she was able to move out of that shutdown state into a more sympathetic response and then bringing that down into equilibrium. Now, when she came to equilibrium and when the thousands of people I've worked with come to, to equilibrium, another system comes online. So we have the fight or flight, we have the, the dorsal vagal shutdown system, and then another system described in Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory, what he calls social engagement system. And that's what at the end of the session, when Nancy opened her eyes and looked at my eyes, not grabbing, but softly connecting with each other, that was the social engagement system. And again, the social engagement system is about having our bodily on our bodies online, of being present, of being connected to ourselves, and also to be connected with others. One of the other things that I discovered in developing the work is that it's critical because trauma is about being overwhelmed. So in a session, you don't want to overwhelm the person. And I realized, if not by luck, uh, Nancy uh, could have easily been, been re-traumatized by my instruction. Hold one sec. Could you bring the spring and the, the yeah. So I'm going to give you a little prop. No, no. Yeah. And uh, so what was incredibly important was that the person not be overwhelmed because trauma is about being overwhelmed. And so to the brain, to the nervous system, being overwhelmed is not any different than the original trauma. And so again, it was made no sense to help people just relive their traumas if they were overwhelmed, but just to do it one small amount at a time. Um, if it's okay, I'd just like to show a short um, a video. Would that be okay? Hello? Yes, oh, Peter, well. that would be absolutely no problem. Okay, so it's gonna just take me just, a moment to do this. Yes, I will give you sharing rights. Right, okay, I wanna just open it first. Mute. Uh, here we go. we go. Whoa, where did that go? Ah, ah, here it is. Okay, what you're going to see here is a chase that goes on at the uh, like 130, 140 kilometers an hour. That's about 160, 65 miles an hour. And it's the chase of a chase of a um, impala trying to escape from a cheetah. And again, just getting in mind that this chase is going on at 65 miles an hour. The cheetah is the fastest land mammal at, at speeds of 65 miles an hour. However, they're only able, the cheetah is only able to sustain that for about 20 seconds. After that, their energy is spent and the impala would have escaped. And just to know that the, um, that the, uh, the cubs of the cheetah if she's unable to make a kill in at least one in six times, that they will starve and they will perish. And also the mother will perish and the species will perish. So it's a really vitally, it's not only life or death for the Impala, it's life or death also for the cheetah. But that's how things are in nature. So what I'm going to do now, uh, I am gonna go, to back here 
and whoops. Ah, here we go. Ah. Okay, so share screen. Here we go. With audio, here we go. And share. And when you're watching this, become aware of your own sensations, your own feelings, your own thoughts or images that might come up for you when you're watching this, this short video. She dashes forward. That's of course the flight response, fight or flight response. All energy is mobilized for the life or death escape. There the time. This time, Duma has killed a good-sized female impala. Unfortunately, in the plane, one's own gratification often stimulates another's envy. Duma's catch has been witnessed from start to finish. The spy is Mama Kingua, a spotted hyena. She knows that Duma is completely exhausted by her final sprint. And yet, things may not finish as we thought they would. For sometimes the weak are capable of cunning trickery. It's a profound physiological state. So let's summarize what's going on here. Oop. Hello. Are you seeing me? Oh, there we go. Okay. So let's just look at the energy level of the uh, of the gazelle. Okay. So of uh, the the gazelle or the impala. So they're in an uplands meadow, grazing on grass, nurturing their young. And if we just look at their energy levels, they're a relaxed and alert. Both are relaxed and alert. Then they sense danger, and so they activate to a little higher energy level, and then the chase goes on. And then all of the energy that they can muster in their bodies is mobilized in escape. Then we saw at the moment of contact, the cheetah bringing down the impala, so that all of this energy got locked in and you saw it because the body was motionless. That same energy, though, for escape, it was still there, but it was inhibited. And then, as the coast was perceived to be clear, the gazelle released again that energy and off it bounded. Now, so that's the normal response. So the, there was the first the flight response, then the energy became locked down, to use the term locked down in a different way. And then the energy released in the escape. What happens with people, unfortunately, is that we become frightened, or which leads very frequently to traumatization, is we become frightened. Oh, uh, are you seeing my, are you seeing me full screen here? Hello? Yes, Peter, people see okay. you full screen. Okay, just checking. So anyhow, uh, with, with, with people, with human animals, with people, this, that energy does get locked in, but we fear that very energy because the sensations in our bodies that would take us out of traumatization become uh, fearful. 
And so we inhibit. So instead of releasing the energy, because if we release that energy all at once, that energy would be exploding, but we would be overwhelmed. So because people are afraid of these very sensations, again, the very sensations that take them out of immobility into a hyper, uh, a hyper uh, activated state, and then which would then go to, to equilibrium to rest, um, that they, they become inhibited. So all of this energy gets locked in there. Because the fear is, if and if it were released all at once, that energy would explode out. And as I said before, this can lead not only to um, to this um, this energy being uh, uh, accessed, but of the person being overwhelmed by it. And again, being overwhelmed by the sensations, in terms of what the nervous system perceives, is no different or hardly different than being traumatized in the first place. So the key in somatic experiencing and in enhancing embodiment is to release this energy one small amount at a time. So again, here's the energy that's coiled in here. It's basically in, suppressed. If that re suppression was released prematurely, that'd be explosion of this energy into disorder and into um, overwhelm. So in somatic experience, what I discovered is that releasing this energy one small amount at a time, letting it come to equilibrium, then releasing another small amount of energy, and then releasing it to equilibrium, and then to equilibrium, so that the same amount of energy is released, but one small amount at a time. And when I was starting to teach this, I, again, I was teaching a group of therapists and also I wrote Waking the Tiger, Healing Trauma, where again, I also talk about these basic biological responses that have profound effects on our organisms. So again, the trick is to just to access, to touch in to the trauma related sensations, whatever they are, to just touch in to let them come to equilibrium before evoking another, um, another uh, release of energy and each time releasing a little bit more energy until the full flow of energy is restored and which leads the, uh, the, cheetah, the uh, uh, impala to relaxed alertness where they started. So in other words, it returns us to equilibrium. As you saw with Nancy, it not only returned her to equilibrium, but it gave her something even more, which was this sense of being held in warm, tingling waves. One of the other things related actually to what happens in trauma is what I call pendulation, which again is critical in, in uh, accessing and resolving traumatic reactions. So this is a little toy, it's called a Hoberman sphere. You can get them on Amazon. And what happens when people first uh, become aware of their body sensations, particularly people who have been traumatized, it actually feels worse. Because we're cut off from our sensations, so we're not feeling them, but when we do begin to feel them, it feels like it's worse. And so the trick then is to, got, to just touch into the experience enough so that the person can, can feel, can experience this contraction, which then will lead to an um, expansion, which then will lead to another contraction and then to another expansion, another contraction and another expansion and so forth. So again, the idea is just touching into the traumatic sensations just enough and then to help guide the person, the individual, the client to experience through the contraction to an expansion, to another contraction and another expansion and another contraction and another expansion. Let me also uh, show you another demonstration. Oops. 
Hello. Ah. And it's going to take me a moment to do this. Okay, it's just going to take me a moment or two here, I hope. There we go. Okay, uh, share screen. And share. Got it. So, again, around the theme of embodiment, uh, let me maximize this. Yeah. And it is a journey from trauma to awakening and flow. And here's an image, again, from nature. A lot of my material I draw literally from nature. What flow looks like, what it feels like. But again, just feeling, sensing in your body. is from moving from fixity to flow. And in ancient Japan, there was a tradition called wabi-sabi. It's not the stuff you put your dip your sushi in. And the idea is that um, that when a, a, a cup, which is really a center of uh, Japanese living, is damaged, is is cracked, what they do is they fill the crack with gold. And the idea is that when somebody has been injured, and they're able to transform their injury, then it is like gold. It is something deeper and more beautiful than before the injury even happened. And here's another um, example that um, helps people, help me teach uh, the therapists who were studying with me how, uh, what to look for and how things work. And so this I call the stream of life uh, uh, exercise or the stream of life um, uh, model. It's, it's like a metaphor. It's a, partly a metaphor, partly a model. And so what you see here, let me get, um, yeah, okay, but let me, whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on. let's get my laser pointer here. So this is a stream and the stream flows within the banks represented by these black um, perimeters. And um, here's a boat that is to say our bodily experience, which flows along this stream. And it has full range within the energy currents of the stream. Now, during the, our lifetime, as children and as adults, we meet different obstacles along with our li in, along our lives. And I'm re representing this by these stones that are in the stream. Now, what can happen is, yes, there's a restriction when we meet these challenges, but when we meet these challenges, then we're able to go into the full flow of the stream again. 
So here it is passing through, there's a constriction, but then an expansion into full embodied experience. Now, trauma is something very different. Trauma is like a force that acts from outside and causes a rupture, a breach in the, in the, uh, the uh, bank of the stream, in the barrier of the, of the uh, stream. And uh, it leads to feelings of overwhelming helplessness. Um, Freud, I think it was around 1916, he really um, uh, made a very good definition of trauma. He said, trauma is a breach in the protect in the protective barrier against stimulation, leading to over to feelings of overwhelming helplessness. I just changed that a little bit. The trauma is a breach, a rupture in the protective barrier against over stimulation, leading to feelings of overwhelming helplessness. So what happens here is now when the person comes anywhere near those traumatic sensations and images and flashbacks, they're drawn, they, there's a vortex that forms outside of the stream. What's what happens whenever you have a, 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 a rupture of, 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 of fluid um, moving outwards, it will form into a vortex. And so then as the, as the person comes anywhere near the trauma, which I call the trauma vortex or the black hole of trauma, they are sucked in to this vortex and in and in and in. So, in other words, they're re-traumatized. So what people do um, to, um, to avoid being sucked into the trauma is they actually go as far away from the trauma as they can, represented by this pathway. So in other words, so instead of being sucked into the trauma vortex, they're now constricting and avoiding any of these sensations so that they can pass through without being swallowed up by the trauma. The problem, of course, is that the person's light stream now has been greatly minimized. They've lost contact with the alive, sensing, knowing body. So neither of these is an adequate solution. Then, there is a third solution, a third possibility, which is the solution. And that is whenever we have a vortex going in one direction, there will almost always be a vortex moving in the opposite direction. And I call this the counter vortex. So now when the person moves towards these two vortices, we help the individual, the client, move into this counter vortex and then around the periphery of that counter vortex and then using the momentum to move then only to the outer onion layer of the trauma vortex. And you see on the boat there, there's a small figure, uh, a blue and a red figure and with their hands like this. And the key here is in not avoiding the vortex, but in being able to, to take one element from the counter vortex. And again, these are usually positive resourceful experiences and then connect them, hold them together with the trauma vortex and then coming back into the mainstream as an integrative process. And it's this holding together of opposites, which is profoundly impactful in embodiment. Peter, it's Mark here. Um, we've gone past the hour, but that's okay. We can go for another five minutes. And there's some great questions here. Can I can I ask you a couple? Sure. And I also was going to let me just show this, and then I was going to do an exercise with people. Oh, uh, so we have another another five minutes for either okay. Q and A or an exercise. Yep. Yep. Okay. So let me just finish this. So this time, then the the person is back fully embodied in the mainstream. So um, I'll take questions, but let's just do an exercise together first. Remember when I talked about Nancy, how she went into the shutdown state? 
when in the shutdown state, our guts are all disturbed. And there's this vagus nerve. It's the largest nerve in the body that goes from the brainstem down throughout the whole body, particularly the organs in the uh, below the diaphragm, the subdiaphragmatic organs, and um, and especially the gastrointestinal system. So we see something that's upsetting. We're walking outside and and we see somebody falling off a bicycle and laying on the ground, and so. Uh, our brain tells our guts to go, ugh. This nerve that goes from the brain to the body that many people don't realize, and Darwin actually first realized it, was that that nerve is 80% afferent. So in other words, it's taking messages from the gut and sending it back up to the brain. And so what happens is we see something like yuck, then that yuck signals goes up the vagus nerve and then is amplified in the brain, in the brain system. So we start with a ugh, and then it becomes amplified to ugh, and then ugh, ugh, and we're stuck there. We're stuck in that distressed sensation, and we're robbed of our energy. We can't focus. We, um, we have no energy. We're not able to be in the here and now. So the one of the exercise here, and it's a very simple exercise, is to actually put a new signal from the guts back up to the brainstem to say all is clear, all is okay. And what I found the the best exercise for this is, or an, a really good exercise to help this, is what I call the VU exercise. And again, I'm just gonna I'm gonna demonstrate it, and then if any of you want to to do it yourselves, be free. And often it brings up sensations, but the sensations might sometimes be a little bit um, disquieting, maybe even a little bit frightening. But again, as we pendulate, as we go into this contracting state, then we move into an expanding state. So the exercise is to take an easy full breath, and on the exhalation to make the sound v, v, coming from the belly, feeling it as though it's coming from the belly. Well, it is. So you're then vibrating the receptors in the belly, which is sending a signal back up to the brain that says, all clear. You don't have to be shut down anymore. You can come back into life and embodied life. So I'll demonstrate it. I'll, and then we can do it together if you want. So. Then letting the breath and the and the sound all the way out, and then letting a new breath come in, filling belly and chest. And just rest and just notice sensations, feelings, thoughts, or images. Anything that comes into your stream of awareness, but particularly body sensations. So shall we do it together? Let's just do it twice. And I don't wanna uh, stimulate too much um, activation. So easy, full breath. And let the breath and the air go all the way out. And letting the breath come in, feeling belly and chest. And rest. And again, just notice sensations, like is your fingers tingling? Do you feel any trembling or any warmth or any coolness or coldness anywhere in your body, anywhere in your body? Whatever comes up, just noticing that without judgment. Any sensations, feelings, images, or thoughts. Okay, Peter, we are okay. out of time, but I want to ask at least one question. So I'm going to be fair and ask the top voted one. Okay. And that is, 
Do you have any tips or exercises to work on dissociation slash tonic immobility? Well, this is one of them for sure. And another one kind of adding to this is involving also the jaw. And remember the guts have to do with the shutdown system, the jaw with the active system. So that's again, if we can get to that phase, then we will be experiencing a deeper sense of um, if settledness and embodiment. So here's the exercise. So starting with the VU. And again, just being aware of sensations. Somebody wrote that their dog came in right then, and another person said, my dog did too. Yes, animals recognize this very, very, very love in a very lovely way. Absolutely. And then the cat came, my, another dog, another cat came in. Exactly, because you're resonating with them. You're connecting with animal instincts when you do this. And the animals recognize that. And they'll, as a number of you said, uh, it said like a didgeridoo. Indeed, it is like a didgeridoo in terms of the sound, but you're also making the voo directly from the belly. But, vid but didgeridoo is a very useful tool for people who have been in shutdown. So absolutely. Okay. My Peter, cat is gone to attack. Okay. <laughs> we do need to wrap up. I know this is frustrating for people. There's so many good questions there. And I, I want to make sure my team get a chance to eat before the next shift starts fairly shortly. Oh. So, um, th Peter, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll put your website in the chat there. I recommend Peter's books if people want to learn more about this to check those out. Uh, you're a legend in this field, so we do appreciate your time today. Um, as ever, people, if you want to buy the recordings, the library includes Stephen Porges, David Pacelli, Alanis Morissette interviewing some of the big names in this field, uh, the Gabo Mate interview, of course. So all that is in the library if people would like to take their time and be spacious with that. We will no doubt be discussing uh, this work in the Facebook group if people are there. And if you're keen to talk to each other more, the coffee breaks, you can click on top right, the three little dots on the portal top right, there's a big red coffee cup. That will put you in a Zoom room with other human beings where you can chat through this session. Uh, we always go back to the speaker for the final word. However, Peter, we're putting together a book of top embodiment tips. Uh, do you have a one sentence tip for the book? Um, well, you know, I mean, really all of my books are about embodiment, going kind of in a sequence of adding more and more detail and more and more and more different exercises, you know, that people can do. So that's in Waking the Tiger. It's also in a book CD I did for Sounds True called um, Healing Trauma, a pioneering, uh, pi pioneering research for restoring wellness or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, there are lots of different exercises. Actually, I'm working on a program right now with Sounds True for people who have these physical conditions, like I described, they're sometimes called MUS, medically unexplained symptoms, like fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, so forth, to help them move through these states back into aliveness, into embodiment. And again, you know, this conference, I, it couldn't have a better title and more related to the way I see trauma as a journey towards greater and greater embodiment. Peter Levine, thank you very much for your time. All the best from everyone at the Embodiment Conference. Okie doke. Okay, I just leave here now, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we see you again, Peter, tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so where, where are you located? Where are you from? Uh, I'm right now in London and uh, usually living in the Netherlands. And I had a very, very lovely conversation with your assistant, Melissa. So, so big, big thank you to her. She did Great. an amazing job. Okie doke. Okay. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Bye.